Hi everybody and welcome to another video lecture on plant classification and plant nomenclature. You've already learned a lot about plant classification and plant nomenclature in the earlier units and you may be wondering why we're making such a big deal out of knowing the full botanical name in a class like this. So in this lecture I'm going to describe a few practical reasons why I think it's important to know the full botanical name and a lot of the time the family, why it's important knowing how to describe a plant and recognize its physical characteristics. None of us can remember all of this information though, so it's really important too to know where to find this information and you'll be practicing this in some of the labs. One of the situations we're trying to avoid with all of this learning about classification and nomenclature is a situation like this one on the right in the photo, which is obviously supposed to be tongue in cheek, but has actually happened to me on a number of occasions. So you've already heard that plant common names can be confusing. The same plant may have different common names in different parts of the country, and nobody's going to know what on earth you're talking about usually if you use English common names in another non-English speaking country. So it's really useful to know what the full botanical name is, or at least how to look it up correctly, if you're visiting another country and want to talk about plants with other plant people. But I never travel, you might say. Well, how about traveling virtually, or at least communicating with plant lovers from other countries? Most of the social media plant groups have members from across the world who are sometimes posting in other languages. So it's really helpful to know the full botanical name of a plant you're talking about so you can share information accurately about your plants with other plant geeks in these groups. It also helps to be able to describe a plant accurately and succinctly so you can give people in social media groups detailed information if you need help in identifying a particular plant and again, we'll be working on these skills in the labs over the next 14 or 15 weeks. Another really good reason for knowing the full botanical name is to get what you want, both online and in person. Plants and seeds are readily available online, often being offered by people who don't know very much about plants. So it's useful to know what the full botanical name is of the plant you want, so you can try to make sure the plant or seeds being advertised really are what, what, you're, what you're looking for and aren't being wrongly advertised by the seller. Similarly, you need to know what the full botanical name is when you're ordering plants from a nursery for a design or installation job. There are many plants with similar names and many plants have many different cultivars or subspecies. Not including the full botanical name in your order may result in you receiving completely the wrong plant and wasting a lot of your time and the nursery's time putting the mistake right. A mistake like this may also delay the project, which may result in increased costs and an annoyed client. Not including the full botanical name will also lose you some points in the class plant identification quizzes. So let's look at an, at an example. Abelia grandiflora, one of the shrubs on our class list, has several cultivars, including ones with plain green leaves and ones with variegated foliage. And these all have different sizes at maturity. There are photos of Abelia grandiflora at the bottom left here. And they're compared to Abelia grandiflora confetti on the bottom right. And you can see that their foliage looks very, very different. Another plant on our class list, Uriops pectinatus, has silvery grey foliage, as you can see in the photo on the top left, whereas its cultivar, Uriops pectinatus viridis, has bright green leaves. These two plants have similar forms, size, texture and flowers, but the colour difference in their foliage could make a big difference in the aesthetics of a landscape design if you order and then install the wrong plant. Another example is Penstemon heterophyllus, foothill penstemon, 
which is a herbaceous perennial that grows natively in parts of the California coastal ranges and Sierra foothills. There's quite a bit of variation in the physical characteristics of this plant in the wild, especially in leaf size and flower color. And nursery folks have taken advantage of this by introducing plants to the nursery trade under different cultivar names. For example, there's Penstemon heterophilus electric blue, there's Catherine de la Mer and Blue Springs. There's also Margarita Bop, which was a seedling found at Las Palitas Nursery in San Luis Obispo County in California. To confuse things even more, there may be plants available in nurseries that have been grown from wild collected seed, so are just marketed under the straight species name. Selecting or ordering the wrong foothill penstemon cultivar could impact the water needs, disease susceptibility, and the length of blooming season of your planting. There are also differences in the physical characteristics of these foothill penstemon cultivars. So again, you need to make sure that you get the full botanical name right, including the cultivar name, when you're ordering this plant. While knowing the full botanical name is really important, it's also really important to know what the plant looks like and to be able to tell the difference between it and close relatives so that you really do get the plant you want. Occasionally, even when you use the full botanical name, the nursery supplying the plants delivers the wrong plant. For example, a few years ago, a landscape contractor I know took delivery at a job site of a plant order that was supposed to include the California native grass, California fescue, or Festuca californica. The nursery delivering the plants delivered Stipa tenuissima, Mexican feather grass instead, which is not a native grass and in fact is really invasive. This could have been a really big mistake if the contractor accepting the delivery didn't know the difference between these two grasses and was able to reject the Mexican feather grass on the spot. Another real life situation where it helps to know what the plant looks like is if you're trying to match an existing planting. For example, let's say you're doing maintenance on a hedge that consists of the New Zealand native shrub Pittosporum tenuifolium that you can see in the photo here and you need to replace one of the plants because it's died. You find when you look this plant up that there are several cultivars of Pittosporum tenuifolium available in the nursery trade in addition to the species, plus four other commonly available Pittosporum species, Pittosporum eugenoides, Pittosporum undulatum, and Pittosporum tobira or tobira. And it could look really strange if you replace the dead plant with the wrong cultivar or even the wrong species. So again, the take home message here is make sure you know and use the full botanical name and you know what the plant should look like. You may be thinking that you don't need to know how to identify a plant because there are apps for that. And yes, there are. And some of the better ones are listed here on the right. Some of them are very, very good, and some of the apps are terrible, and I haven't listed the terrible ones on this slide. But even the very good ones aren't infallible, because there just may not be enough detail in the photos you upload to the app for it to identify the plant correctly. Or it may be, may be able to identify a plant to genus or species level, but not to cultivar level. And that's what you might need if you're trying to replace a plant in an existing planting. So it's up to you, the human, to be able to interpret the information thrown out by plant identification apps and decide if the results are accurate. That's where a lot of the plant identification information that we cover in this class comes in useful. So the take home message from this slide is that some of the identification apps are great, but don't take their results as gospel. You don't need to learn which family a plant belongs to for this class, but it's important for you to be aware that all plants are classified into families and to be able to research the correct family when you need to. So let's look now at some of the practical design and cultural reasons for knowing why a plant's family may be important. 
Let's say you're a landscape designer doing a planting scheme for a client who you know has really bad hay fever. You decide you want to use a burgundy leaf plant with a V-shaped form with perhaps upright to slightly arching linear foliage to use as a, fo as a focal point. Three choices you may consider are shown in the photos here. A burgundy leafed formium, which is on the right. One of the relatively new design align cord align hybrids on the bottom here. And then the good old tried and true Penicetum rubrum, purple fountain grass on the upper left here. Or you may want to use its newer relative Penicetum fireworks. While these plants all look somewhat similar, as you can see in the photos, they're all classified not just in three different genera, but three different families. Formiums in the asparagus family, cordylines in the aloe family, and penicetum is in the grass family, the poaceae. So what, you might be thinking? Well, remember that your client suffers from really bad hay fever, and it's exacerbated by pollen. All plants in the grass family, the poaceae, are wind pollinated, which means that grasses aren't great plants to select for people who have hay fever. So there's an example of a situation where knowing what the plant family is might help you to avoid poor plant selections. Knowing what family a plant is in, especially the grass like monocots, is helpful because it reminds us how a plant may respond to pruning in particular to being cut back in height. All grasses, as you've already heard, are in the Poaceae family. This is the family of true grasses. They're not sedges, they're not rushes, they're not restios, they're grasses. And the feature that unites all of these plants is that the growing point of their leaves is at the base of the leaf. The leaves of all other monocots have their growing points at the tips of the leaves. And this means that you can cut back the foliage of grasses and those same leaves will regrow. This is why grasses make such great lawns. The grass leaves will have a blunt tip where you cut them or mowed them, but the grass leaves will continue to increase in length. This is in contrast to all other grass-like monocots, such as sedges, cordylines, lomandra, dianella, iris, astelia, and the formiums you can see in the photo here. All these plants have leaves that won't regrow when they're cut back. Many home gardeners, and sadly, many landscape professionals, think many of these plants are grasses, and therefore they cut them back by topping them, as you would with grasses, and the result is plants that look like these formiums in the photo. This is just plain bad pruning and a lack of understanding of plant classification and nomenclature and a lack of understanding as to how plants grow. Having some knowledge of what family a plant's in can also help you make educated decisions about herbicides. For example, the label on the right is from Fusilade 2, which is a commonly used herbicide, especially on golf courses, that's selective for grasses. You can see on the label that it says for the control of grass weeds. A selective pesticide is one which only targets specific plants or pests in contrast to a non-selective pesticide like Roundup, for example, which controls most kinds of non-woody plants. But what will happen if the person responsible for pesticide application at your workplace thinks that weedy plants like horsetails or nutsedge are grasses because they look like grass-like plants. And he or she or they apply Fusilade 2 or in ed edible crops use the Fusilade DX formulation to control these plants. Well, that person and their boss are going to be disappointed. Neither horsetails nor nutsedge are in the grass family, the Poaceae. Horsetails are in the horsetail family, which is actually classified with the ferns, and nutsedge is a sedge. And all sedges are in the sedge family, the Cyperaceae. So not only will the weeds not have been killed, but money will have been wasted on the herbicide and the labor to apply it. 
the applicator will have been exposed to unnecessary risk while they're applying the pesticide. And very seriously, there may be unnecessary ecological damage by having applied a pesticide needlessly. The take home message here is read the label carefully of any pesticide, and that includes herbicides. Only use the product on the labeled target organisms and if you're any doubt about whether or not the pesticide is effective on your intended target, get in touch with the manufacturer or a licensed pesticide advisor. Plants in some families can be sensitive to particular minerals in the soil. So again, knowing which family a plant is in or being aware that you should look it up can help you to make educated cultural decisions for plants as far as fertilizers concerned. It can also help save some money as there's no point applying fertilizer if a plant doesn't need it or if it's going to harm the plant. One of the most common examples is plants in the protea family being sensitive to phosphorus, which is a common ingredient in many fertilizers. Some of the most popular evergreen water-wise shrubs for coastal California landscapes are members of the protea family, and many of them have showy flowers and colorful bracts. These plants include protea, leucodendron, and leucospermum, which are native to South Africa, and banksia, grevillea, and hakia, which are native to Australia. We've got examples of all these plants in the Southern Hemisphere Garden at Cabrillo, and there's also a fabulous collection of Southern Hemisphere shrubs at the UCSC Arboretum, which you should go and see. The plants that you can see in the photo here are a banksia on the left-hand side and the Australian shrub Hakia on the right-hand side. Plants in the Protea family differ in their phosphorus sensitivity, but usually there's no need to add phosphorus to most soils in Monterey Bay landscapes. If too much phosphorus is applied, symptoms that you'll see on the plants may range from blackened necrotic leaf tissue to even death of the plant. So this is definitely something to watch out for with this particular family. Similarly, knowing what family a plant's in can sometimes help us determine what soil pH the plant prefers and therefore decide whether or not a plant may be suitable for a particular location. Many plants tolerate a wide range of soil pH, but plants in the heath family, the Ericaceae, usually perform better in soils with a lower pH of around 5.5 to 6.5. Common landscape plants in the heath family include rhododendrons and azaleas, which became popular in California back in the 1920s and 30s. The family also includes trees such as Arbutus marina, Arbutus unedo, and our native Arbutus menziesii. Common shrubs like the California native manzanitas and blueberries. And finally, knowing which family a plant's in may save you, a loved one, or a pet from a visit to the emergency room, or worse. It's good to know that all plants in the nightshade family, the Solanaceae, have parts that are poisonous. The degree of toxicity varies between species, but from a design point of view, these may be plants you want to avoid if a client has pets who love chomping on plants or young children who love to put things in their mouths. Common examples of plants in the nightshade family include tomatoes and eggplant. The fruits, of course, are fine to eat, but the foliage isn't. Potatoes have edible stem tubers, but again, the foliage is poisonous. And common ornamentals in the nightshade family include purple potato bush, white potato vine, angel's trumpet, which you can see in the photo, and Brunfelsia, which is an, an ornamental shrub that you don't see around much anymore, but it has the wonderful common names of Kiss Me Quick, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, and Lady of the Night. So that's the end of this lecture. I hope you can see now that learning plant botanical names and plant identification isn't just about geeking out. There are some really very practical reasons too for learning all of this information, or at least knowing how to look it up accurately. 
So take a break now or head back to Canvas to continue with this module.